Hello and welcome to Newsmax TV. I'm David Patton and we're delighted to welcome former Pennsylvania Governor Ed Rendell, author of the colorful new book, A Nation of Wusses, How America's Leaders Lost the Guts to Make Us Great. Governor Rendell, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, David. Well, your book's title comes from an Eagles-Vikings game that was canceled after less than six inches of snow fell in December 2010. Your reaction in an interview and a subsequent Washington Times editorial was that we were becoming a nation of wusses. But the subtitle of your book suggests it's not Americans, but rather American leaders who have lost their nerve. So which is it, weak leaders or a weak political system? I think it's, it's weak leadership. Uh, I think our leaders have become so scared, so interested in self-preservation of their own jobs, so risk averse and so afraid of their bases. I think our, our leaders, our elected officials, are afraid to tell our constituents, their constituents, the truth. You know the old Jack Nicholson movie where he says, you can't handle the truth? Well, I believe that people can handle the truth. I became governor of Pennsylvania and the outgoing governor handed me a $2.4 billion budget deficit. Pennsylvania was one of only nine states that didn't put any money into pre-kindergarten and full-day kindergarten education. I wanted to change that. So I put together a package that was the second highest tax increase in the history of Pennsylvania. And most governors, almost all governors who had increased taxes did it in their second term when by law they couldn't run again. I was the first to do it in my first year. Three years later, I had a very charismatic opponent who put $15 million on TV reminding people I raised taxes. Not only did I survive, David, I won, but I won by a margin of 21 points because people weren't dumb. They knew that I was handed a deficit. They knew we had to do something. And they knew that for the tax increase, they got a vastly improved educational system. Our kids' scores went through the roof. We created a ton of new jobs in energy, in infrastructure, and the state uh, health care, we, we covered all of our children with he basic health care, access to basic health care. So the people sa said, by going to the polls and giving me that resounding vote, we understand. You had to raise taxes. We weren't happy about it, but we understand and you did the right thing. And too many of our leaders are afraid to deal honestly with our, our people. I think the reason we're in this economic fix today, the U.S., is because the Republicans won't talk straight to their base and say, we're not going to get out of this without raising some revenue, guys. And the Democrats won't talk straight to their base and say, look, seniors, when Medicare and Social Security were passed, the average life expectancy was 65. We're now living to 85. So we've got to do something to, to, to reduce the overall costs of the program. And we can do it with a little bit of pain, not a lot, a little bit of pain, but the pain has to be equally shared. Honesty goes a long way, that's for sure. You also write about the importance of America still being a nation willing to take big risks. Yet many business owners, as you know also well, uh, say today that the level of uncertainty is simply too high, that they aren't sure which risks are sound and which might be reckless. And they blame the policies coming out of Washington. Are they just making excuses? I think so. I, I think you and I would agree that regardless of whether you like Warren Buffett's politics, you'd agree he's a pretty good businessman, right? Well, he said he's going to invest a billion dollars more in his business this coming year than last year. So if Warren Buffett can do it, I think everybody else can too. I, I think this city on the sidelines, look, the bottom line is right now, businesses in America have become more productive. It's happened over the last 10, 12 years. And as they become more productive, they're less job intensive. And that's one of the problems that we face. So we've got to look to business to create, to create new businesses, new exports that create more demand, things like that. Uh, we've also got to create new businesses, alternative energy businesses, uh, uh, the natural gas, the shale boom is creating jobs. We've got to find ways we can create jobs, but we have to have government spending, too, if we're going to get out of this recession. You know, I love to hear the Republicans say, oh, governor's, government spending, we can't afford it. It's going to plunge us into a recession. Well, both President Reagan and both President Bush's, they faced with their recession, they increased government spending significantly, and that helped get out of the recession. There's got to be spending in the economy. And I would hope that businesses are, are, would see that there are opportunities and start to begin to invest. 
but I think it has to be businesses, and I think we do have to have government spending, but not needless or useless government spending, repair our infrastructure. The American infrastructure is falling apart, and we're falling behind competitively. 2004, the World Economic Forum rated us number one in infrastructure. Last year, they rated us 16th in infrastructure. We are not investing in something that's crucial to our public safety, our quality of life, our economic competitiveness. So that would be a good way for the government to inject money into the economy, creating well-paying jobs in construction and manufacturing, two very, very important sectors of our economy. Governor, you end your book by stating there's one last race you would love to run, but not for yourself, rather for Hillary Clinton. You write that you would invest your heart and soul in trying to make her president. If you would be candid with me, do you ever regret the fact that Hillary lost in 2008? Well, uh, look, I think Barack Obama took the worst set of problems that any American president's been given, and it's done admirably. Do I think Hillary would have done as well? Sure. But she would have been encumbered with the same set of problems. Might she have done better? She had a little bit more experience in the... Uh, Senator Obama was a legislator all his life. Sa uh, Senator Clinton had a little bit of experience in the executive branch when she was with her husband. So she might have done things a little differently. But again, with those overwhelming problems, who knows? But I will tell you this. I believe Hillary Clinton would have made a great president in 2008. And as you know, I worked my heart out for her. And, in the last month and a half of the campaign, I was almost the last public spokesperson she had. In fact, a reporter called me the last of the Mohegans. But um, I, her job as Secretary of State has convinced me, and I think it's also convinced millions of Americans, that she would just be a lights-out president. Now, by all accounts, the Obama administration is run by a pretty tight circle. Several prominent Democrats, including former President Bill Clinton, Newark, New Jersey Mayor Cory Booker have been critical of the president's attacks on Bain Capital. Uh, president Clinton appeared to question his opposition to extending the Bush tax cuts. Do loyal Democrats feel that they're so frozen out of the inner workings of the administration that really the only way they can get their message across is to go public and to speak out? Well, I, I can't speak for <clears throat> President Clinton or, or Cory Booker uh, but I can speak for myself, and I think the same holds true for them, particularly President Clinton. Look, you can be critical of an administration and still be supportive of it. You know, Governor Romney was asked to rate President Obama's performance in seven or eight different areas, and he gave President Obama an F in every area. Well, I think he just lost credibility by doing that. F in foreign affairs? Come on now, Governor, that's just not right. And so... I think to be an effective surrogate or advocate for someone, you have to admit that our guy's not perfect, their guy's not the devil. You've got to admit that, and by admitting that, you build your credibility. Look, David, we all know 80% of America knows exactly how they're going to vote, and they knew how they were going to vote on January 1st. 40% are voting Republican, 40% are voting Democrat. It's the 20% in the middle that are the key, and you have to talk to them intelligently. So I guarantee you, Bill Clinton in October, when it counts, when the rubber meets the road, Bill Clinton will be the best salesperson for the Obama reelect you can find. And one of the ways he'll be a great salesperson is people will remember that he didn't trash Governor Romney, he didn't demonize him, he said he's qualified, but his plans are just not the right plans. So I think it, it, it's effective. The Obama campaign sometimes takes the position that if we're saying anything critical, we're being disloyal. We're not. We're, we're being realistic, and I think, as a result, are, 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 are much better persuaders, much better advocates for the president's reelection. Now, earlier this week, as you know, the Federal Reserve reported Americans' wealth has dropped 40 percent in three years. Today, President Obama said Mitt Romney's economic proposals represent a return to the failed policies of the past. Should the president accept any responsibility for an economic crisis that has left 22 million Americans either unemployed or underemployed? Well, well, well sure. Uh, obviously, when you're in charge, you know, you have to bear some of the burden. But I think Americans should remember that the day that President Obama was sworn in, we had lost almost 800,000 jobs in one month. And the next month, before he had a chance to have any of his policies, we lost 750,000 jobs. 
Well, the last 27 months, we've gained private sector jobs. Now, the last two or three months, the gains were not good, but there were still gains. They were still on the plus, plus side. And a lot of that's because President Obama had the guts to do the financial bailout, very unpopular, as you recall. He had the guts to do the auto bailout, tremendously unpopular. He was in Ohio today, and even the Republican governor of Ohio, John Kasich, brags about the fact that the Ohio economy has turned around. They've got an unemployment rate 3 percent less than they did four years ago because of the auto bailout, because the automobile companies have come back and so many manufacturing and suppliers are in Ohio. So the president, I think, has done a good job. And, and could he have done better? Are there things we could have done? Yes, there are things we could have done, but it required Congress's approval. The president's jobs bill would have put at least a million Americans to work in fairly good paying jobs. The Republicans, for whatever reason, even though most of the components of the job bill were things Republicans had supported in the past, they turned their back on the jobs bill for, I think, political reasons, and so we didn't do it. But, but sure, the guy in charge always, you know, always could do better. But I think under the circumstances, what he inherited, President Obama's done pretty well. And he, he did it by making unpopular decisions. I mean, you remember, uh, David, and, and I don't mean to question you, but how popular the financial bailout was. People despised it. You remember how critical the public was of the auto bailout. The president did the right thing, could have paid the price for it, but it turned out our economy didn't tank, and the auto bailout has allowed American car manufacturing to come roaring back. Would you have any advice for the president in terms of damage control related to this unfortunate remark that he's since walked back, stating that the private sector was doing just fine? Well, uh, I think he meant in compare, comparison to the public sector. Whereas we've gained 20, uh, j private sector jobs 27 months, we've lost public sector jobs significantly. That's what I think the president meant. The president should acknowledge that the private sector growth and the resurgence in the private sector has been is there, and I can compare it to what it was when he took over, but acknowledge that it's not as fast as he wants, and I know that's the truth. I've talked to him about it, and it's not as as fast and as rapid as any American would want, but that we are headed in the right direction, and I think this election is going to boil down to who the American people believe, particularly the, that 20 percent undecided, who they believe have the best plans for the future to generate economic vitality and create new jobs in a fairly short period of time. I think that will decide who's going to win this election. And last question, Governor Rendell, the other big wild card out there, the whole nation is waiting for the Supreme Court's ruling on the constitutionality of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. If the ruling goes against the president, how significant would that be in November? I don't think it... it um particularly hurts him. I think the people who don't like the bill aren't going to all of a sudden like it because it was ruled unconstitutional. The people who support it are going to be disappointed, and I think it may fire up the Democratic base because it will again uh, demonstrate to them the importance of the Supreme Court. Um, in terms of how it's going to play in the election, if the bill is struck down in its entirety, or even if the mandate is, is eliminated, both Governor Romney and President Obama are going to have to answer the question, okay, what are you going to do now? How are you going to cover 31 million Americans who don't have coverage now? What are you going to do about pre-existing conditions? So a five-year-old girl contracts leukemia, uh, she can't get health care if, if there's no rule against health insurance companies barring her uh, from uh, uh, coverage because she has a pre-existing condition. Those are questions that both sides better be prepared to answer. And again, I think it's their answers that will be the persuasive to those undecided voters. Very important questions that lie ahead, regardless of how that verdict comes out. Former Pennsylvania Governor Ed Rendell, author of the new book, A Nation of Wusses, How America's Leaders Lost the Guts to Make Us Great. Thank you, Governor, for joining us on Newsmax TV. Thank you, David. Thanks very much. And thank you for watching Newsmax TV. Thank you.